will continue our examination into the trench coat mafia and trench coat mafia members, both official, non-official, as well as other friends of Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris. Some believe they simply had foreknowledge. Others believe they may have actually assisted in some capacity either before or during the shooting on April 20th, 1999. We'll also be taking a look at search warrants executed in regards to Trenchcoat Mafia members and other individuals in Eric Harris and... So some highlights from the search warrants that were released, I believe this was 2003. The first portion covers Brooke's backpack and its contents, nothing suspicious, just books and items you would expect to find in a high school backpack. There were also search warrants here for computers, email, any correspondence, communications between any of the following individuals, Dylan Klebold, Eric Harris, redacted, redacted, and redacted or between any current or past members of the Trenchcoat Mafia. We can only guess they're talking about Chris Moore, either Morris, Heckler, Dykeman, Robert Perry, Brian Sargent, Joe Stair, or any of those combinations, because they're the usual names that are repeated. So some curiosities here. This is page 25,671. Investigator Larry Erzin. Upon duly... Being duly sworn upon the oath says that the foregoing offense or offenses alleged was committed of this affiant's own personal knowledge and the facts stated therein are true. Your affiant is of lawful age and a sworn peace officer of the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, Golden, Colorado, in the county of Jefferson. Your affiant states that the following facts are true and based upon his or her personal knowledge as a result of his or her conversations with the person named herein and reviewing their written reports. On April 20th, 1999, investigator Gary Kleiman of the Colorado Attorney General's Office, was assigned to assist an investigation by Jeffco regarding multiple homicides which occurred that date at Columbine High School. April 20th, 99, located at the crime scene was an explosive device shown to investigator Kleiman by investigator Glenn Grove of Jeffco. Investigator Grove said the device was identical to another he recovered on March 22nd, 1999, located from a residence Address redacted Arvada, County of Jefferson, State of Colorado. The device was in possession of a juvenile. Redacted, date of birth, redacted. So juvenile means under 18 here, so that does eliminate certain members of the trench coat mafia. Investigator Kleiman reviewed the investigative report by Arvada Police Department. It indicates that redacted received the device from her friend. Uh-oh, so this is a female. Redacted date of birth redacted, of redacted Arvada County of Jefferson, state of Colorado. Redacted told investigator Grubel of the Arvada Police Department that he had learned to make the device from Eric Harris, who has been identified as one of the two suspects who committed the homicides at Columbine on April 20th, 99, and also placed the explosive devices found on the school premises. The other suspect is identified as Dylan Klebold, both allegedly members of the gang slash group known as the Trenchcoat Mafia. April 21st, 99, Investigator Kleiman spoke to Redacted, the father of Redacted. He advised Investigator Kleiman that after seeing the news reports of the incident at Columbine High School, he located in Redacted's possessions a notebook containing notes and sketches which may relate to the construction of explosive devices and notes by Redacted regarding her relationship with Redacted and possibly others. Redacted is presently in detention or a juvenile sentence to Mountain View School Division of Youth Services. Based upon the affirmation in information, your affiant respectfully requests that the court issue a search warrant for the residence located at Redacted County of Jefferson State of Colorado. Here's a post, a curious post, June 18, 2003 on Tapa Talk which is, I guess, a combination of a bunch of different forms. Well, this proves that Jefferson County knew about Eric Harris's bomb-making before April 20th and did nothing. They tried to hide the fact that the Browns gave them information on Eric. They then tried to discredit and accuse Brooks of wrongdoing, when in fact they had this information. Cover up at the very least. Now, this part bothers me also. Russ Cook is on leave of absence, and Ted Mink is taking his place. Ted Mink was chief of police of Arvada, when Columbine and the Arvada bomb-making incident took place. He had to have all this information. Now he's the acting sheriff of Jefferson County, the very agency 
that has lied and lied and lied. How strange that Mink takes over just before the information is released. Something to think about. Just another one of those coincidences. Page 17,900. This is April 20th, 99. While clearing Columbine High School of Bombs, Deputy Glenn Grove advised on a bomb. Redacted taken from Redacted. Investigator Kleiman received info that Redacted told that the bomb came from Redacted Redacted, who learned to make bombs from Eric Harris. Also Redacted is in Mount View detentions. But has a diary at home with bomb diagrams. Lead contact Redacted or family to obtain purported diary content Redacted to determine if he did in fact learn bomb making from Harris. Assigned to Eaton and Kleiman. April 26, 99, search warrant conducted at Redacted Residence. Book seized and now in Jeffco evidence. Redacted also interviewed, denies learning bomb making from Harris. Also denies being acquainted with Harris. Report attached. So apparently there's an individual here supposedly accused of learning how to make bombs from Eric. But perhaps it was the other way around. Who knows? I mean... There's so many missing pages in the reports, all these things redacted. I mean, will the truth ever be known unless all of this can be foiled without redactions? What's curious, uh, page 25,772, Robert Perry supposedly consented for his AOL account to be searched on May 13th, 99. And who knows what may or may not have been removed at that point. And again, what level of forensics was used to find anything that could have been removed or deleted. Also, there's some copies of orders here, all records sealed until further order of the court relating to a lot of these communications, various phone numbers, search warrants. I mean, it's just, it's really crazy. Regarding Dykeman, page 25,792, Nathan Dykeman told investigators during an interview he had not been truthful because he thought he would be blamed for the shootings. And we have to keep that in mind. A lot of these trench coat mafia members, how truthful were they early on? Because what are the options? They were scared, so they lied. Or they told the truth, but then were told to change their story or else to match the narrative. Or they were given some kind of immunity in exchange for certain information. I mean, this it's, it's really tough deciphering all this. Dykeman told agents Harris and Klebold had been experimenting with bombs for over a year. On April 20th, Dykeman said he left Columbine High School at 11.20 a.m. to go home and eat lunch. When he returned, he was met by police barricades. Dykeman said he returned home and watched several news reports and had several telephone conversations with Klebold's father. Since these interviews were conducted April 21st, Nathan has moved to Florida to finish school. So he got out of Dodge. Here's an article from Rocky Mountain News, 1999. I don't see a date here, but this... Uh, is in relation to Nate Dykeman. Victor Good's house seems uncommonly quiet as he sits at his desk near a window that overlooks Columbine High School. Gone are the sounds he describes as those of normal, awkward teenagers, which until recently included his stepson, Nathan Dykeman, 18, Nathan's best friend, Dylan Claybold, and his friend, Eric Harris. From a balcony in the tidy upper middle class home, Good and his stepson watched through binoculars two months ago as SWAT teams surrounded Columbine. They saw at that distance wounded student Patrick Ireland's desperate plunge out of the library window. It is where Good first heard Nathan's prediction, Nathan's chilling prediction, that Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris were the boys with guns who killed 12 students, a teacher, and themselves and wounded about two dozen others. And it's curious if the prediction included just the two of them, that it was just them two acting alone. Now it is where Good and his wife, Julie, Nathan's mother, mourn a different kind of loss. They have not seen Nathan since three days after the shooting. They haven't spoken with him since he packed his bags and left home with his biological father, Matt Dykeman, to move to Florida Good said. Nathan walked out on his graduation, on the funeral of his friend, and on the only family he has known for six years. The images left to the goods were from Nathan's national television appearance on ABC's Good Morning America, where he talked about his two friends. 
and from the story that appeared about him in the Florida-based supermarket weekly National Enquirer. Both media organizations, Good said, paid Nathan thousands of dollars for his appearance, something Good and his wife warned Nathan not to take, something Good says bitterly has helped disrupt their family. His Disney dad is responsible for that, Good said. Good said Nathan was paid $16,000 by ABC for an innocuous videotape he and Klebold had made. He also said an ABC producer called their home and offered him money for an appearance and suggested they might make 2 or $3 million from a book deal later on. Good said they were not interested. He said the media's luck changed after Nathan left his Colorado home. Reached at his father's home in Florida, Nathan tells a different story. I was broke. I had to leave my truck in Oklahoma where it broke down, he said. Now my college tuition is paid for. I've been criticized enough for this. What was it I did wrong? I know at least a dozen people who were offered money from the media. Nathan says he wasn't paid for an interview, but for the videotape that he and Klebold made of a trip to school. He did enter into an agreement with the National Enquirer, which he now says distorted, mischaracterized, and misquoted what he said. The Goods' trauma might seem less dramatic than the devastation that descended upon the families whose children died or were wounded by the two high school killers, but Good said it seems as though they have lost a child. April 20th was the longest day of our lives, Good said. It's, it's like it took a month or more to turn the page on the calendar to try to go on with living. I suspect there will be a lot of families who will face something like this, said John Keekbush, chief of investigation for the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department and lead investigator in the case. This is the kind of thing that can happen to people who go through these kinds of traumatic experiences, he said. It's very hard to understand, said Good, his voice cracking. Nathan was so close to his mother, he was kind of a mama's boy. His mother sat by the phone all day on Mother's Day. The phone never rang. Nathan said the fallout came over the reaction of his, fa of his stepfather and mother when they learned that his friends Klebold and Harris were the killers. He said it was as if they ceased to trust him, to believe him. They were terrified, he said, that he was somehow involved. They tore apart my room, he said. They threw away my heavy metal CDs, anything that had a skull on it or something like that. I couldn't believe the way they treated me. He said he believes his stepfather feared the police would come with a warrant to search his room and find something incriminating. Immediately after the shootings, Good admits he was very direct with Nathan. He warned him that because of his close relationship with Klebold and his longtime association with Harris, they had known each other since eighth grade, Nathan would get caught up in the investigation. I told him if there was anything, anything at all that we should know, to tell us now, Good said. We had already watched on television as police led Chris Morris away in handcuffs. Morris, a close friend of Harris, Klebold, and Nathan, was released after being questioned by police. They all worked at Blackjack Pizza Parlor, as did Philip Duran. Duran has been charged with helping Klebold and Harris acquire a semi-automatic pistol used in the killings with possession of one of the illegal sawed-off shotguns used in the attack. Shortly after the shooting, Nathan was identified publicly as a member of the Trenchcoat Mafia, a Columbine clique alternatively described as outcasts and computer geeks. Good said linking his son to the group is one of the long list of things the media got wrong. And it was implied in some news reports that Nathan could be a suspect. Good took Nathan the day after the shootings to the FBI, where he was interviewed at length and given a lie detector test. He did not take an attorney. Also, there's a lot of speculation online about how many of these members of the Trenchcoat Mafia might have been offered immunity in exchange for information. So, therefore, if the investigators later did find out that they were involved in the shooting in some way, either in planning or at the school, there's nothing they can do about it because they already granted them immunity before that. And there'd be way too much outrage so that it's better to just keep up this narrative, create this narrative that it was just Eric and Dylan at all costs, no matter what, all of these hundreds of witnesses are hallucinating and all of these things and just seal all any records to the contrary.
And it's almost like a two birds, one stone situation because if the police look bad and through all of this poor investigation, didn't follow up on Eric Harris, all of these things, it kind of accomplishes everything by just sealing as many records as possible and rewriting the narrative. And then, of course, if there is some kind of MK Ultra component, same thing. It would be the same. For all these theories, it's kind of like the same game plan to keep it under wraps. Good and his stepson have declined to say what Nathan told investigators. But court documents show the information Dykeman gave authorities helped lead to Duran's arrest. Dykeman spent more than 12 hours talking to the FBI and was interviewed later by agents of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. I was never treated as a suspect by the FBI, Nathan said. They were just after, you know, information about Eric and Dylan. So that's curious. So clearly Dykeman had critical information surrounding Blackjack Pizza and possible Trenchcoat Mafia members and the acquisition of firearms. Very curious indeed. Dykeman had a falling out with Harris over a girl Nathan was dating in January, but they still shared four classes, including a bowling class at Columbine. Good said his stepson was kind of afraid of Eric toward the end. Nathan said he wasn't so much afraid of Eric as he was concerned about him. He was more and more depressed last summer, he said. He had a lot of things he was trying to figure out. He was seeing a psychiatrist. I was concerned about that. Nathan maintained his close friendship with Klebold, but saw less of him in the last few months because Nathan became more interested in dating, Good said. Good said that as Nathan pulled away from the two, Harris and Klebold grew closer. Because of his son's close relationship with Klebold, the Goods and the Klebold's parents became friends. Good said he had talked with Tom Klebold almost every day since the shootings. They have had lunch. The Goods also attended the funeral service for Dylan Klebold and spent three hours with the family at the funeral home that evening. There is also a sore point with Nathan. He said he talked to the Klebolds before he left town, but was not told about the funeral service until it was too late. They told me I missed, they just told me I missed it, he said. I would have wanted to go. Good says his son's friends, whom the world now knows as cold-blooded, brutal, and compassionless killers, were guests in his home thousands of times. But Good said he never saw any indication that Klebold or Harris were capable of what he calls a monstrous crime. Neither, he said, did the Klebolds. There were no warning signs about these kids, Good said. There was nothing that you could point to that would say they were ever capable of such a monstrous act. All this stuff people said about them that day, about them being goths, the Marilyn Manson music, using black makeup, their obsession with Hitler and the Nazis, being part of a national hate group, that was all ridiculous. It was all wrong. Nathan said reports that Harrison Klebold were in, morning cla in bowling class the morning of the shootings were also wrong, just as were reports that they frequently shouted Hail Hitler during bowling classes and wore Nazi insignia to school. People were saying their parents had to know what they were doing, that they should have seen this coming. That's wrong too, Good said. They didn't know because no one knew. No one but Dylan and Eric. And is he playing damage control here for his son, Nate Dykeman, his stepson? Everyone in America wants to believe that there were warning signs so they can believe it would never happen to them, to their children. Nathan said he too remains confused by the events that occurred. I last talked to Dylan at the bowling class on Monday and I didn't talk to him after that. Something happened in that last 24 hours and I wish I knew what it was. Actually, there is a date here, June 28th, 1999. Couple of posts here by Star Viego, a popular poster with a lot of these theories. He posted this September 6, 2004. Interesting, how could Dykeman have been a suspect at noon and been home two hours later when they see Pat Ireland being rescued? Something is not quite kosher here. I also noticed that a lot of the Trenchcoat Mafia got to the small screen after April 20th. Pauline Colby was on a TV show. Reference number here, 8551. McDuffie was on the Lisa show, 4145. Horst Russ Mueller was on one of the late night talk shows, 8979. Splatterpunks on the Sally Jesse Raphael show. Chris Morris and Corey Friesen on ABC's Nightline. Brian Sargent on the news, 6195. Joe Stare on Channel 9 Today, 6550. 
and now it's Dykeman on Good Morning America. I call it hiding in plain sight, and if he got 16 large, how much did the other guys get? A response here, I could not agree more. I had a friend that used to sell pot before he was killed in a wreck years ago. He told me the best way to hide from police is to hide in plain sight. He said nobody ever expects you to hide in the open. He told me when he got it, he would drive through the police station and talk to the officers and just shoot the expletive. Then he would do whatever it was he did. He said all smart criminals did it and would laugh. Seemed to work for him. Some interesting posts here. Supposedly, the surveillance tapes confirmed that Dykeman was the fire truck boy. I thought he was arrested afterwards, but I think I'm confusing Morris for Dykeman, and I think Nate knew. He was right when he predicted Eric and Dylan as the shooters, and he hops out of the area as soon as possible. He doesn't even stay for Dylan's funeral. I think he's trying to cover his own ass, just a hunch. But how could he be two places at once? Maybe good is covering for him. Does anyone know the exact times of the fire truck incident and Patrick Ireland being pulled through the window? Maybe if you compared. It seems like Nate was really busy April 20th. Confirms himself that he called Tom Klebold that day, asks if Dylan is at the residence. When Mr. Klebold says Dylan is at school, Nate tells him about the shootings. Klebold goes to Dylan's room looks in his closet and notices Dylan's coat is not there. This prompts Mr. Klebold to call Jeffco and ask to be a hostage negotiator. It is confirmed in the 911 tapes as being fire truck boy. My opinion, and this is a poster on a forum here, September 25th, 2004, that he was an early shooter and backed out. This is referring to Dykeman. He was involved somehow. It shows because he knew Eric and Dylan were the shooters. And that's curious, too, because if all of the Trenchcoat Mafia guys bragged about wanting to shoot up the school and kill everybody and blow up the school, he seems, to, if he only indicated Eric and Dylan, that's curious because other individuals seem to have included Eric and Dylan with other names like Chris Morris or Robert Perry or Brian Sargent. Stepfather Victor Good claims Nate was with him all day after the shooting started. It's not humanly possible to be in three places at once. 